Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Colonel Bob Thompson. Uh, I am here today with Lieutenant Colonel Pete Lowenheim, who's the Maryland Wing Standards and Evaluations Officer, primarily concerned with flight operations. Welcome to the Maryland Wing Conference and welcome to the pilot meeting. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Lohenheim will be uh, talking to you about pilot operations within Maryland Wing. As a reminder in chat, if you've not already done so, please include your CAP ID, name, and unit. In addition, from time to time, we'll be putting up a link for the session evaluation at your convenience. If you could go ahead and fill that out, it would be much appreciated. Um, Moving on from there, uh, any questions that you have, please feel free to go ahead and put them in chat and we will take care of them as we can. And at that, I'm going to go ahead and move this on over. Uh, Colonel Lohenheim, uh, the show is yours. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, not sure you can see uh, me because I can't see me, at the moment, but let me fix that up a little bit because I can see the whole chat going on and when it is, I can't see anything else. So anyway, uh, you may notice that the ceiling fan is running. I wanted this to feel as realistic as it could. And uh, while I couldn't have a regular uh, single engine propeller going at the same time, I thought I would have the uh, uh, ceiling fan going just long enough to give you the opportunity to feel comfortable um, that you are in an aviation uh, forum here. But with that, I think we're going to shut it down and uh, we will proceed with the meeting. So um, if my co-pilot would be willing, please uh, shut the fan down. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and oh my, I keep seeing more chats and more chats and more chats and that's all good. All right. So what we're going to do today is um, we're going to present a uh, PowerPoint, talk a little bit about what's um, important and what's going on uh, in the wing at this moment. And if there's time at the end, um, we'll take your chat questions. It's possible if we uh, can make it work, we'll have you turn on your mic and I may be able to answer you directly. Uh, one of the things about um, the conference pilot meetings over the years has been um, the ability for uh, people who fly our airplanes to actually meet each other, see each other, used to be touch each other, you could shake hands, all that's gone now. And it's impossible to simulate that as we do this uh, live uh, um, on screens. <clears throat> so in the meantime, um, we're gonna try to make this uh, represent what we typically do and um, uh, essentially we want to cover some material and we also want to uh, give you a chance to be part of the forum. So uh, without further ado, if I can actually make this work, I'm going to try and let you see my slideshow. And this should be here. And let's see if it's going to share. Bob, is it uh, is the slideshow um, edit mode showing? Uh, no, uh, still just have the video, no share yet. Okay. Right. Take that down. And see why that is. Well, everybody stand by for a second. Let's see what we can do. Try that again. Uh, 
All right. Hmm. Everybody stand by while we have technical difficulties getting corrected. It's, I can do this. We'll start over again. Well, what do you see now? Uh, I'm seeing the blue dot with PL in the middle of it, so it looks like it might be getting there. But no slideshow yet. Hmm. Well, it is not letting me do it. And it worked earlier today, so let's see what's going on. Screen one. Desktop. Anything now? There it is. You guys see it now? All right. Bob, can you see the screen? Yes. Now you have it and you are good to go. All right. It's a good thing we had about uh, 15,000 feet with the engine out before we got it corrected. So that's a good thing. First of all, again, welcome everybody to the conference. Um, <clears throat> this particular pilot meeting again is uh, we're going to try to duplicate what we do every year uh, as best as we can virtually. Uh, as he said at the beginning, is Lieutenant <clears throat> um, Thompson, I am Pete Lowenheim, um, the Standards and Evaluation Officer for the Wing, also the Chief Check Pilot. Um, I check the check pilots. And uh, what we're going to try to do at this point is bring you um, up to date as to what's going on and how it's affecting the wing. So what we're going to talk about today are aviator skills, and how they are affected by uh, reduced flying due to COVID. Um, what CAP is doing to accommodate those pilots that are stuck in this uh, limbo, and which, by the way, is a moving target, as uh, most of you saw from Lieutenant Colonel uh, Henderson yesterday. Things are tightening up. So far, we've been able to pretty much stay where we are. But as everybody knows, uh, the whole country is uh, is watching the pandemic uh, go totally out of control. 
And we'll also talk about the new series of regulations and standards that came out, uh, which is part of what's called the 70 series. And then if we have time at the end, we'll go over pilot onboarding, which is an attempt to recruit new member uh, pilots to become part of our pilot cadre. Um, but I uh, want to start with the aviator skills that are affected by reduced flying due to COVID. Um, as most of you know, one of the things about uh, flying is that it's not that hard to get rusty. It's uh, not quite like riding a bike, okay? People said that uh, over the years about pilots that they never forget how to fly, just like they never forget how to ride a bike. But in today's world, that's not quite as simple as it used to be. Uh, part of that is because of our technically advanced aircraft. And one of the issues with that, in particular the G1000, although it's also true with the uh, uh, other um, electronically displayed um, instrument panels that we have is that they can't put everything on the screen at one time, although there's an awful lot on the G1000, uh, even on two screens. But as you know, it's a book that's divided into chapters and then the chapters are divided into paragraphs and the paragraphs are divided into sentences uh, to be able to get all the information that you need. You need to know how to manipulate the book so that you can find the information that you need without being so distracted that the airplane uh, is essentially out of control. And that's where we find our folks um, becoming the most rusty <clears throat> in trying to remember uh, in the technically advanced aircraft where everything is and how to find it and how to use it for flying. As uh, all of you who do fly technically advanced aircraft know, you don't just get to get in the airplane and do a couple of things on the checklist, which is interesting. I have a Lance from 1977, and there are a couple of placards that are on the instrument panel which essentially are the pre and, and uh, post-flight checklist. You know, it pretty much says, make sure your uh, seat belt's on and don't break anything. Um, the new checklist, as you know, is multiple pages just to get to the point where you're ready to take off. Um, and the same thing with pre-landing and then post-landing. Uh, that's where we're finding people most rusty and it's turning out to uh, make for some very unpleasant flights at various times for people. Uh, because they're so busy trying to figure out where something that they once knew was and now they can't remember. Uh, now, in addition to that, the actual hand flying skills get rusty as well. Um, you'll find that uh, you, you are behind the aircraft a lot more than you were at one time. It may take you three arrivals before you can consider one of them a good landing. Uh, and that's not unexpected. Everybody knows that that's going to be the case if you haven't flown in a long while. Um, now, um, essentially, um, what's happened is uh, we're having to go back and look and see why this is happening <clears throat> in particular and how we can fix the problem uh, for those folks that are finding themselves way out of practice. So one of the questions that you might want to ask yourself is how often did you fly before there was a pandemic? Were you one of these guys that did Bay Patrol every week? Were you uh, the type of person that even if you weren't flying uh, per, uh, for CAP uh, uh, and uh, just trying to keep yourself current? Um, did you use the proficiency profiles when you flew? Um, or did you just let the whole thing um, you know, be ad lib. Well, I think I'll I'll fly all summer and do Bay Patrol, but eh, when fall comes, on I'll, I'll just uh, hang up the, uh, my spurs for a little while and give it a break. Um, or were you a pilot that flew all the time? Do you own your own airplane? You weren't even flying CAP airplanes, possibly. Uh, as you know, we were limited in our flying when this thing first hit, and uh, everybody was affected by it. Um, essentially you didn't want to be within six feet of anybody much less not have a mask on many pilots don't like to fly with the mask on even now uh, although we're getting more and more used to it um, and we were restricted and the FAA also realized that there were issues for pilots and instructors where uh, 
things that require currency more often than uh, the average flight review, like your medical. Um, and for CFIs, uh, every two years, you have to um, renew your, uh, your ticket. And so they decided to, at some point, um, extend currency requirements. And CAP, trying to keep up with the FAA, tried to do the same thing. Um, and as you know, as most of you know, things were extended um, for a month or two, and then they decided to, it was too difficult to try to keep up with all that, rewrite software for our WIMRs and OPSQLs programs. So they just extended everybody to September 30 uh, this, uh, this year. And what ended up happening as a result of that, uh, we, had, was, we had pilots who said, well, that's a good thing because I'm not flying with anybody. Uh, in the airplane, so you couldn't get a check ride. Um, or um, I don't even like going to the airport. We understood all that, and we gave you till September 30th, but what ended up happening was people who could have done it didn't do it. They procrastinated and knew that they had till September 30th. Well, sure enough, September 30th came up pretty quickly, and suddenly we had uh, pilots who were within, you know, two, three weeks of not being current anymore, looking for uh, check rides, and the check pilots just aren't that available. Most of our check pilots uh, work full time. There are a few who retire, uh, but in terms of uh, trying to get a, a decent check ride, you probably need to contact them in advance, if not a month in advance, uh, just to try to get things squared away and possibly even come up with a rain date if that doesn't work. Well, CAP realized that that was a problem. Um, our check pilots weren't current either, so we had to get the check pilots current. Then we could get the pilots current, and it just was too tight a squeeze. So they've decided to extend all of your um, requirements, not the FAA requirements, but the CEP requirements until the end of December, and they said, and that's it. But again, we don't know what's happening because when they said that, the pandemic hadn't gone out of control like it is right now. Now, one of the things that the FAA did not extend was your instrument rating. If you're an instrument rated pilot, you still had to do your six approaches uh, within six months and the other things that go along with it, you know, uh, being able to um, and do, you know, various types of approaches and also, uh, you know, follow airways and do whatever else is required for instrument rating. Uh, or you could take an instrument proficiency check, and that's fine as well, but they did not extend that. They did extend medicals um, for certain uh, groups, and there are other extensions that the FAA has allowed, uh, but um, they're not related anymore to what we're doing. So for instance, you no longer have an, a three month extension on your medical. If it expires before uh, December 30th, then it goes away altogether. So you need to be careful about that. Now in the past, we only required proficiency once a year. Okay, uh, when I say that, you, you had to demonstrate proficiency once a year, and that was you know, a tighter requirement than the FAA who said, you two years with a flight review. But we consider ourselves a cut above. We consider some of the flying we do um, dangerous at, uh, at very best, or um, you know, where you, you, you need to know that your skills are up there. Uh, we offer a tremendous amount of insurance coverage. Uh, and in order to meet the requirements for, uh, for that coverage, we have to prove to the, uh, to the world that our pilots are proficient. And once a year, we would, uh, you know, give you a check ride and sign you off for another year. That was a normal year. That's not happening anymore. So what is CAP doing to try to uh, get this thing squared away so that we go back to having a cadre of proficient pilots? Because again, any learned skill in can and will diminish without practice. That's the basis for what they're thinking. And they're determined to help pilots regain proficiency. And we don't want you taking a Form 5 ride, uh, which for those of you who are not fully aware, uh, is the check ride that we give every year. So they've come up with a way to get you back in shape, so to speak. You can get funded instructional flying. 
so that you can A, get yourself back into shape, and B, get yourself prepared for a Form 5. Now, we just recently had a pilot uh, take a Form 5. He's been flying for years. He did not do very well on it, and most of the uh, reasoning that we were able to come up with was because he hadn't flown in a long time. Um, it's something, again, that you have to be honest with yourself. It's not like riding a bike. It, maybe the actual uh, hands-on flying could be considered that, but with everything else going on in our airplanes today and our special use airspace that we're surrounded by, and the other issues where it's not just a matter of getting in an airplane, taking off and landing like in the middle of Nebraska. Uh, in our particular area, you really need to pay attention to what's going on. Uh, and you need to keep up with it and remain current. And that's why we have the proficiency profiles under normal conditions, but under this particular condition, they are uh, offering funded flying to get you back to the original skill level that you had. Uh, and you will find that is um, under mission symbol A24. However, and we'll talk about the 70 series of regulations. In the 70 series, there is CAP uh, standard, okay? That's not a regulation, it's not a pamphlet, it's a CAPS standard, 71-1. And it's it is, uh, there's a chapter that is specifically um, dedicated <clears throat> to return to flight status and there's a syllabus that goes along with that. Now for those of you who are close enough to your computer screen to see it, I'll leave this up a little while. This is what you'll find in that standard. Um, it, and this is only part of it, but this is a this is the subject matter and I think you'd all like to see that. And until you're proficient at all of these skills, and this is just the flying portion, um, I wouldn't ask a check pilot to give you a check ride. Now again, it's funded. You can get it, um, uh, you know, essentially for free. And you definitely want to do this. And I would suggest doing it whether you've been flying somewhat recently or not, because it's great prep for the actual Form 5. Let's go ahead and take a look at it for a little while. I'll let you do that. Nothing magical about this, but <clears throat> it does uh, bring up, uh, you know, the, the idea that these are things that we see uh, pilots become deficient uh, at when you take a look at it. Now, um, it says, uh, you know, for instrument pilots only the arrival, but again, it's got radio navigation, it's got GPS navigation. Do you know what WAS is? Do you know what RAIM is? Do you know how to use the autopilot if there is one? holding procedures, uh, you know, precision and non-precision approaches, and even missed approach. Uh, then the pattern work, you know, we need to see uh, that you're capable of doing this. Most of you are aware of the fact that we had a uh, mishap at a short field in Maryland, and you can see it's there uh, in the uh, syllabus showing short field landings and short field takeoffs. Um, and that's an issue in Maryland. A couple of years ago um, at Hartford, Zero Whiskey 3, we had a flight clinic uh, for short field and soft field practice. It's a perfect uh, location for that. There's a big, long grass field and there was a very short paved field. And now Hartford has totally ruined that by putting in a beautiful brand new runway where the grass was. So we're still looking for a place to do that where our airplanes are not going to get loaded up with turf or anything else. But anyway, in uh, being serious for a second, if you take a look at the short field takeoffs and landings, that's a problem in CEP, uh, especially for people who fly at 5,000 foot fields or even 4,500 foot field and then end up having to go to a 2,500 feet foot field that essentially ends up uh, having displaced thresholds. So. Any, in, under any circumstances, you might want to go up with an instructor and do this 
and you can do it under uh, the guise of uh, getting yourself a return to flight status and do this uh, as you want. OK, so let's talk about the 70 series of regulations and uh, and the standards. OK, um, and pamphlets, by the way. So there are regulations, standards and, pa and pamphlets. And what they've done is they've taken what used to be um, in the ops um, on the ops uh, web page uh, in CAP and you had to read between the lines and you had to put two things together and then uh, if this, then that or whatever. And they have tried to give you everything you need to know about CAP flying in or in an organized fashion and organized forms. Now some do refer, one refers to the other. Uh, as I said, that uh, 71 uh, standard that I just showed you also refers to the other um, essentially a regulation that says this is how you get to return to flight status, but it refers you to that so you can find it. And it, you know, it's not in the same uh, uh, pamphlet or uh, you know, essentially set of regulations, but it does point you to it and you can find out uh, what you need to know. Now, my suggestion is that at least once, everybody should go through the 70 series. It's 70, 70 uh, dash one and a bunch of others and uh, 71 and so and so. Uh, you need to go through all of them at least once to get yourself familiar and then keep a copy electronically or any other way you want to do it uh, and refer to it from time to time. Now, one thing that does happen with CEP, you may have noticed, they will come up with a regulation or they will come up with something that says this is how we're going to do it. Somebody comes back and says, I don't know, that, that could be a problem. They will look at it again and say, you're right, we're going to have to update it or edit it. And it happens all the time. Uh, the only way for you to stay up to date is to constantly go back and see if there's a latest version. In the 70 series, the latest version of a couple of items is October 20. Came out in March and there have been four revisions since then. So you need to make sure that you're up to date with what they want and how it's being done. But everything is explained in that series. Um, I, I will tell you that, you know, I've been in uh, CEP since uh, General Lieutenant was a long time ago. Um, and uh, this is the most comprehensive uh, set of regulations, pamphlets and standards that I've ever seen. Um, and while it's a lot of reading and uh, there are a lot of facts and there are a lot of uh, issues that are addressed, you really need to be up to date on everything. OK, so let's talk about pilot onboarding. OK. Um, I've gotten a couple of different explanations about this, and I do want to tell you that we, for a while, were in limbo uh, with people who were um, in charge of the flying aspect of CAP. Uh, for, uh, we had a guy who was really great, um, did a terrific job, was uh, instrumental in getting the 70 series out, and unfortunately kept USAF got a hold of him and he's now working for them. Um, his name is Kevin Conyers for those who may know. And uh, in his place he is uh, Mike Moyer, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Moyer. I don't know if any of you, I guess he's Colonel. I don't know if any of you are, uh, know him or know him personally. He is uh, former Delaware everything, including I believe Wing Commander. Uh, and he had the job originally uh, before Kevin Conyers did and now they've invited him to come back and he is um, doing a great job. He's trying to catch up uh, again and you know, be up to speed. However, <clears throat> excuse me, um, he's not alone this time. He's got help and I would ask for a show of hands, but I won't be able to see it. How many people have been to NISA? Okay, I'm assuming you're holding your hand up. The um, the person who is pretty much in charge of NISA, other than Desmaris, is Eric Templeton. And Eric Templeton has been chosen to work with Mike Moyer 
um, on all kinds of pilot issues, pilot things, pilot uh, questions that people have about interpretation of uh, the new rules and regulations. And um, what I was told was that the, um, the mission symbol A0 is to be used to bring pilots who were not CAP members on board and become CAP pilots. That is not the way it's written in the regulation. Um, and I think they're going to have to clarify that. This is for people who are pilots who want to become CAP pilots and have no idea how we do things and are often very much intimidated by it, as are most folks who are accustomed to going to an FBO, uh, dropping some money on the table, taking an airplane up for a, a ride around the pattern and taking their, uh, their, fr they, their friends to the beach or however they do it, come back, put the airplane away and that's it. It's not how it works in CEP. And when, our, when we bring new pilots in, or we bring pilots who are C, uh, FAA pilots, but not CAP pilots, they're often very intimidated by what we do and how we do it. Um, starting with having to get fingerprints. Uh, a lot of people object to that. So um, they've decided that we need to have more pilots who are FAA pilots become CAP pilots and we want to reduce the stress and the intimidation level. And if you look at 71-1, and see, and that, by the way, is a standard, and 70-12, which is a pamphlet, it explains how pilots can be onboarded using the A0 mission symbol. And we want as many of those guys that are out there and gals that are out there uh, to please become part of our pilot cadre. We're hoping that they will not just become pilots, they'll become mission pilots, possibly instructor pilots, possibly check pilots, um, but they need to start somewhere. And unfortunately, and I, I totally get this, and I think most of you do too, uh, when you hear what it takes to become a CAP pilot, it often will make you think, well, uh, I, I like CAP and I want to be a member, but that's that's just too much. And why do I have to take a check ride every year when the FAA only makes me take one every two years? Um, and we go through, you know, um, trying to, to console these folks and say, no, it's not that hard. Um, and by the way, the fact that you get a check right every year should be something that you like, because if there uh, is something that you can improve on, you'll find out in that check ride. Or if you are very good at what you're doing, that'll be reinforced in the check ride. But very often uh, we found that uh, the pilots are reluctant to even uh, dip their toe in the water. And this is a way to try to get that done. And for those of you who um, are not familiar with the pamphlet, Here's a picture of it. Okay. It's a uh, cap pamphlet 70-12. It's called Pilot Onboarding, Making New Members into New Pilots. It's not new pilots. It's, it's actually uh, essentially CAP pilots. And it's a resource guide for new pilots and for the people who are going to help them, the mentors, and see what, uh, what we can do to try to allay some of those fears that have uh, over the years become uh, a major issue. So the, the gist of this program, uh, I'm going to call it a session today, was to kind of keep you guys up to date uh, with what's going on with uh, having to deal with COVID um, and our airplanes and all the things that are connected to that, like having to clean an airplane before you get in it, to clean an airplane after you get in it, to disinfect it. Um, very unpleasant for folks who are not accustomed to having to do that, but for those who are willing, uh, it can be done, at least at the moment, you know, we're still in phase two. Um, and the fact that CEP is recognizing that our pilots are suffering um, from uh, having not flown in a very long time in, in some cases, uh, which is demonstrated on people who have not gotten themselves back in the cockpit one way or the other and uh, having trouble on a form five where they never had trouble before and making funding available for those of you who would like to be able to 
um, feel very comfortable that your skills are back to the level they were before COVID, uh, and it's free. And, um, you know, when I first joined CAP, they told me it stood for common pay, and it did. We paid for everything out of our own pocket, and it was a special day if we got a free check ride. Now they realize that uh, if we want to keep our pilots and we want to make new ones, they're going to have to help with the funding, and it is there. And you know, it, it, while it's coming from CEP, it of course originates from the Air Force. The Air Force wants the CEP pilots to be the best that they possibly can be, because look at the missions that we're doing these days. Um, up to last year, about this time, we were escorting drones uh, in two different places in the country. In Syracuse, the uh, drones were actually uh, based at Syracuse Airport, uh, and they had to get to the uh, area where they could actually practice by going through the uh, regulated airspace, controlled airspace, and they were not allowed to do that because the pilot wasn't in the airplane. <clears throat> in the airplane, well, they could probably tell you what color underwear you had on that day from 20,000 feet with that incredible uh, eyeball that it has underneath. It only had about a 30 degree um, forward looking uh, camera, which meant that planes that were uh, further uh, from a peripheral standpoint than those aircraft uh, were not going to be seen and the escorting uh, CAP pilot would warn them that there was an issue. In also including clouds. They were not supposed to fly in clouds without uh, declaring an emergency. So we were up there escorting them back and forth. And what they decided at some point was they didn't need us because they were going to come up with a radar system uh, that could do what we do uh, or what we did. And uh, as it turns out, uh, they couldn't get the radar up and running. So we ended up doing this for what was supposed to be six months to a year, almost three years. Um, now that required A, going to Syracuse, <clears throat> leaving the area, B, being qualified, excuse me, being qualified in a Cessna 182 turbocharged aircraft, which also happened to be G1000. So there's quite a skill level requirement there. And then you had to learn to do formation flying. Now, when I joined CEP, the most difficult stuff we did was search and rescue and possibly disaster relief. But that just required being able to get there and back and be safe and the whole bit. Now it requires special skills. And uh, even more skills are required at Green Flag, which is, um, uh, you know, takes place in Vegas and uh, a few other places. And um, that requires flying a 206, a Cessna 206, operating the ball, which simulates what's on the drone, and you actually have to take courses before you can do it. <clears throat> That's a skill level for our pilots, that fairly new, and it's only going to become more complex. And <clears throat> because of that, we're going to have to keep the cadre up, and we're going to have to keep the skill level of the cadre up so that we can supply these folks with, uh, uh, you know, personnel to make this work. Unfortunately, although this was not deliberate, obviously, um, there are more hurricanes and uh, we're doing an awful lot of relief, especially photo relief for them. Um, I and a few others that are probably watching this were involved in um, a photo mission in Puerto Rico where we actually took our airplanes from uh, the mainland to Puerto Rico. Uh, I was in a, a pilot, uh, an airplane that went from uh, Baltimore to um, San Juan, flying over a lot of water, which required another skill, and that was, um, you know, be, to be able to fly over water, you'd be able to, you know, be water qualified, um, and uh, instrument <coughs> requirement because we didn't necessarily fly in good weather, and um, you know that and that was just to get there to take pictures. Then you needed to be a skilled pilot to be able to make the um, photographers comfortable taking taking pictures. Um, and we've been doing that in North Carolina. We did it in Texas. We've done it all over. And again, that's a skill that's fairly new uh, that we didn't have before, that we didn't need before. We didn't do that. 
when I flew the, um, the hurricane uh, in New Orleans at Katrina in 2005, we did not do any photography. Um, we were hauling people, National Guardsmen, to, uh, down to New Orleans to relieve the ones that were there. We were flying MREs. We were flying, uh, believe it or not, newspapers because they had no way of getting the news down there. The power was completely gone. Uh, so we were flying materials and we still do that. And we also you know, can do blood, we can do whatever's needed. Uh, but now aerial photography is one of the areas that's really being pushed. And it's not just the photographer who needs to be able to uh, be a good photographer. They need to be able to do it airborne and it won't work at all if the pilot is not able to help. So these are all skills that uh, CEP is taking, uh, it, I mean, that are uh, needed for the uh, missions that CEP is taking on. So anyway, I, I'm hoping that, um, you know, we are going to be able to get back to what we once did and, and take it to the next level. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you when that's going to be, but I can tell you that after talking to Eric Templeton and to Mike Moyer personally, they're going to do everything they can uh, to take pilots who have been around a long time and get them back up to speed and try to get new pilots into the mix and get them up to speed as well. So anyway, this is supposed to be a 50 minute session. We lost a little bit at the beginning and um, sorry about that, but uh, we do think time is permitted and we can uh, answer some questions for you if you have them. So let me take this down and get back to where we were. And I'm going to take this down. Okay, anybody have any questions? Uh, we're going to do it with uh, chat, Bob, or how, well, how are we going to do it? Uh, we can do it either way. Uh, right now, the very first question that came up uh, was, what are the minimum flight hours for a candidate pilot to qualify for A0 pilot onboarding? And the quick response I put in was uh, about the number of hours that you need for a rating, but perhaps you can address the funding question a little bit better. Um, I don't believe there's any requirement for hours uh, other than you need to be a rated pilot, as you said. Um, when we get into a requirement for hours, it's for some of the skills like orientation flying uh, requires 200 hours to be able to fly cadets. Uh, Air Force uh, ROTC uh, cadets um, re requires 300 hours for the pilot. And a TMP, which is a transport mission pilot, in addition to a couple of uh, mission skills that are um, you know, listed in what's called the squitter, uh, you need to have 100 hours uh, of flying time to be able to fly people to and from missions and fly yourself to and from missions. And one of those is um, a maintenance mission. Uh, so if you're a transport mission pilot and we need a plane to be moved from you know, point A to point B, which is usually a maintenance facility, although it could be just transport uh, to relocate, um, you need to be at a minimum a, a transport mission pilot. But to get into the onboarding program, no, we want to get you CAP qualified to fly an airplane, which essentially is a Form 5. Okay, and then uh, the next question, uh, how do we coordinate to fly under A24? Uh, who do we ask within the wing to set this up in Wimmers? Um, I'm not exactly sure who is going to do that. I know that uh, Colonel uh, Valillo does other A missions. We'll check on that one for you, but in the meantime, be sure and get the pamphlet that uh, uh, explains what you need to do uh, to do that. It may, if it's been updated, it may actually say that. But in our wing, the, at the very least, you can contact um, Major Ralph, Major John Ralph, and if he doesn't have the answer, he'll point you to someone who does. Okay, and then uh, next question, I'm not seeing the whole thing. Uh, do you know anything about the headquarters regarding those under special issuance on an FAA medical? You mean whether it's been extended or not? Uh, I'm assuming, yes, the extension that is, is what it says. 
Um, that I am not sure of. Maybe somebody who has one of those knows the answer to that. Um, and it keeps changing. And that's the problem. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure I'm up to date on that particular question. Okay. And then uh, can A0 pilot onboarding funds be used for retraining CAP pilots that have not been CAP current for many years? No. No, that's, that's the um, return to flight status uh, funding. A0 is strictly for onboarding. Okay. And let's see, onboard. Actually, do you want me to uh, go ahead and unmute the mics and, and let folks just uh, ask the questions? As long as we can contain it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me see what I can do here. Okay, so folks are able to unmute themselves. So if you have questions, uh, you can go ahead and pop in. And if you're willing, would you turn on your camera so I can see who you are? Okay, what's your question? The Cerebro, right? Yeah, no question, I just turned a camera. Or your request. Hey Larry, this is Tim. Can you hear me? Hello, Larry. Or Pete. I'm sorry, Pete. This is yes. Tim. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. All right. I'm sorry, Pete. I was saying Larry, and that's my mistake. Uh, brand new senior member, Squadron 28 in uh, Edgewater, and. Um, I am a retired Air Force pilot, a retired airline pilot, a CFII and MEI. Um, got, uh, I don't know, many thousands of hours of flying. Um, been working with uh, Squadron 28. Um, my question is this, uh, due to the uh, limit of uh, airplanes available, uh, instructors available, Etc. I seem to be stalled. I've been trying to get uh, checked out for probably a couple of months. It's sure. not happening. It, what do you suggest I do? Ask the question differently. <laughs> um, uh, Is there a way? No, no, no. I'm kidding. I, I'm saying when you ask the, the check pilot to ask it differently, or the you know. But by the way, Is before there, we go. Person that was going to come out to Cumberland that I told you you probably want to get on board first. Okay, that's me. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, we have a list of instructors and check pilots. Um, they don't need to be near you. Okay. There is a way to get our check pilots to you uh, if we have to. Now, when you say airplanes, we are down in airplanes. That's true. Um, we've had a couple of mishaps that have reduced the number of 172s. And very often our 182s are in um, uh, in maintenance as well. But I need to know your specific issue. First of all, what's the closest uh, see you know, where the closest plane is or normally uh, would be for Edgewater? Do you know? Uh, I believe my squadron had an airplane until recently. Uh, squadron 28, I believe it's due to come back. Um, but I think. Uh, Go ahead. Which one's 28? Uh, right there at Lee Airport. Oh, at Lee, yeah. Um, well, um, it, I don't think it is. Well, here, here's my question specifically. Is, is there a program within the wing where a person who is onboarding has the FAA licenses, et cetera, that, that you were talking about. Is there a way to organize the wing such that that individual can get on boarded and become a pilot vices leaving it to the resources of the squadron, which may be limited? No, the answer is yes, under certain circumstances. My advice to you at this point, have you tried Walt Coates at uh, Martin State? Uh, I haven't done anything. I'm, um, my uh, squadron guys are doing the best they can to 
All right. Try and get me going, but it just seems like after a couple of months. That All right. Well, if, well, it should never take a couple of months. At worst, it should take maybe a couple of weeks. Do me a favor, Tim. Call me uh, personally, and I'll talk to you about it. And I'll I'll get you set up with somebody and get you get you going. How's that? That sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Hey Pete, real quick. This is uh, Smith Velasquez. I know we talked a lot. Um, I have. I know you're having trouble finding an instructor. Aren't yeah, you? but you know, a lot of times, you know, it's it's part of that problem where people are working and all that kind of stuff. So, like, I'm pretty patient, and hopefully Tony is going to help me out. I'm like, yay! And then, you know, both uh, Richard Marco has been trying to really hard to help me with my AP, and then even Curtis has been trying to help me with my Form Five. So I know it takes a long time, um, but one of the things I wanted to know is more for, I have a pilot who's onboarding and pretty soon, uh, she's gonna join once she gets her, uh, maybe I should start. She's a Chinook Army pilot okay. and she's done search and rescue professionally in the military and she's joining my squadron. <laughs> so um, uh, she's doing her transition training right now in New Jersey for her ATP and fixed wing and all that. Once she gets in, I wanted to know what's the best way for me to get her rolling because I know you know I've had the same like experiences where it's hard to get onboarding and everything um but I think part of it is process too I, like I feel like I go through you all the time Pete <laughs> which is why you know my name um so I don't know if there's a process that is already set up that is better to go through to get her started than you know me bugging you all the time or, or trying to find the pilot list well, um, one so thing I can't seem to find actually <laughs> All right, so here's what's going on. Where are you? In, where, where are you? Are you at, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, at DMW, is that where you where, you, where you're? Well, we're down Airy, so we don't have an airport. Yeah. But the great thing is, as we're half away from Carol, half an hour from Carroll, half an hour from Frederick, an hour from Hagerstown, and an hour from Montgomery, and even Tipton. So, like, believe it or not, even though it takes us a little bit longer, we're ideally located, right? We're close, you know. It's, we have yeah. like five airports we can go to. <laughs> right. So let me let me just give you something real quick here. We had two very active Czech pilots in Gaithersburg who, for them, had no issue going to um, Westminster or to where you are. Uh, we're we're, da we're down to I'm going to say a half of one, because one got a job with FedEx flying. That's like Asho Mangistu, and the other one has taken on a lot of students. Uh, you know. At, outside of CEP and right. some in CEP as well. Um, that would be where I would have you start at, at, uh, as for Piotr because he would oh, know. Yeah. If, okay, yeah. He would know if he, if he is available and if he isn't, he would probably know who uh, is available to do that. We also have Marty Sachs who is overworked anyway. I'm sure you know Marty. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> We, we tried to get up, but unfortunately the nav lights were down and the airplane had to be down. So I was like, dang it, we were so close. <laughs> well, and we also, um, you know, we had three Czech pilots, instructor pilots in Hagerstown. Two of them you mentioned, Curtis and Tony. Um, right. I'm, I'm doing my best to not do check rides and not do this uh, kind of instruction because I want other people to do it. I want them to be, you know, I want them to get the experience that I've, been lucky enough to have since the early 90s. Um, but if if all else fails, of course, I'll do it. The problem is what you're talking about and what Tim was talking about, in my opinion, requires a commitment. You can't just say, well, maybe this weekend, maybe not, whatever. It doesn't work. You need to find somebody who will be committed to do this. And unfortunately, over the years, it's because the uh, availability of check pilots has changed. We very often send people off to FBOs and then when they're ready to go, uh, come to us for the actual ride. Because in in my particular <clears throat> way of thinking, I don't want to say to somebody, um, yes, I will do this. And then I have other commitments, so I'm not going to do it. Um, and in CAP, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, um, not all of the folks are lucky enough to have um, family that says, oh, sure, go ahead and do that. That's great. We were going to have a big picnic and invite the entire family from the rest of the United States, but 
go ahead and, and take your student today. Okay, that that unfortunately, uh, what I'm trying to say is family will sometimes get in the way. But I would start with if you're already talking to Tony and, and Curtis, you're you know, you're 75 percent of the way there. And you think see, I can probably just direct her to them too. Then yes, I would do okay. that. Okay, okay, it's like I didn't want her to get frustrated, and I'm pretty tenacious, so you know, like I will never, you know, I'll you be with me. So, exactly. um, if you don't mind, I'm going to agree with you. You are tenacious. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'll fly anything that goes up. Okay, uh, Tony, this is uh, sorry, Pete. This is Bob. Uh, we're we're about five minutes over. Um, okay. So we need to go ahead and finish up. I'm going to go ahead and leave you with this to finish up, and I got to wrap over and get the next section started. Okay. Hey, thanks for everything you did and getting this going. You bet. Not a problem. All right. Catch you later. All right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you again. All right. So let me let me say something before we go. I think everybody is aware that we've had quite a, more than more mishaps than we ever have wanted to have, and the wing is very very concerned. Um, about the mishaps themselves and the impression that that leaves and we are going to have a safety down day and for those of you who are wondering when it's going to be we are working on it because um, we have a, a committee actually coming together to make all of this uh, happen now we don't want it to go any longer than it has to we want to keep it short uh, I mean we want to keep the lead time short if at all possible unfortunately we had this uh, well, we had the mountain flying clinic last week. We've had the virtual pilot meeting this week, and then uh, coming up, we're going to be mixed up in Thanksgiving. Um, and it's it essentially, you know, we're still trying to find a date that works for everybody. Uh, what I'm thinking is based on how this worked, we could not only do it in person, we could do it virtually, a combination of both, unless the governor of Maryland says, no, you're going to have to do it. Uh, online and we'll do that if we have to. Uh, but it is coming up. We do know that a lot of people are, are asking a lot of questions about when it will be or if they missed the date and the answer is no. Uh, it's still in the works. So folks, we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you for attending. I hope it was somewhat informative. Um, and if you have any questions, you know you can always contact me outside of this particular forum. I'm always, you know, here to help. And if uh, if I can't get answers for you, I'll make sure I'll find somebody who can. So again, thanks, and uh, have a great what's left of the weekend. I particularly this uh, conference enjoyed lunch. I can tell you that. Um, I love what they served. The uh, the virtual steak and lobster I thought was delicious. So anyway, you guys uh, have a good one. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and take care.